thanks for coming today, everyone. My name is Stephen Basil. I'm a developer advocate here at Google, where I work with web developers like yourselves to help them integrate their web apps with Google Apps and the Google Apps Marketplace. Uh, before we get started, I just want to get a quick sense of who's in the audience today. So if you already have an app in the marketplace, can you just raise your hand? All right, pretty good, great. Um, and who here is uh, just learning about the marketplace for the first time today? Maybe you went to Scott's uh, earlier talk this morning? Anyone? All right, good. And does anyone actually use Google Apps? All right, that's pretty good. Uh, so today we're going to talk about some of the best practices that we've seen emerge in the marketplace uh, over the past year, specifically in the area of integration. Because integration is such a wide topic, this is not a deeply technical talk. However, I hope that by the end you're going to have a better sense for the value integration brings to both your customers and to your business. And along the way, I'll try to provide some technical tips and tricks to help you get started in integrating your app. For those who are new to the marketplace, it is a business-to-business -business web application store for the more than 3 million businesses and 3 million users on Google Apps to discover, try, and purchase new web applications to help run their business in the cloud. It is not a consumer web store. You will not find games, you will not find media, music, or books, anything of that sort. Instead, you will find our business productivity tools, things like project management, customer relationship management, accounting, financing, expense reporting, need to help run their business in the cloud. We launched Marketplace uh, a little over a year ago, back on March 9th, 2010, and started with 50 apps in the Marketplace. Shortly after, at May, uh, my, last year's Google I.O., actually, we unveiled some new integration points, uh, contextual gadgets for Gmail, and I'm going to go into more detail on this later on. More recently, this past January, we expanded the scope of the marketplace by introducing a category for Google Apps for Education uh, and added over 20 applications for uh, K through 12 and universities. And more recently, celebrated our first birthday this past March and hit a milestone of 300 business applications now available in the marketplace. Today, we're getting close to about 350, and we continue to add more each week. So why? Why the history lesson? Well, over the past year, we've got to work with a lot of different application developers and in integrating their apps, and we've observed a lot of customer behavior over that year. And what we learned, well, might I say, we still have a lot to learn in terms of what makes uh, for a great marketplace app and successful experience, but over that year, we have seen certain trends and best practices emerge. The one I want to focus on today is integration. So talk about integration, uh, I'll just give you a couple examples of what I mean by this. For starters, it includes things like providing a universal navigation, a quick way and a consistent way for users to access their app and sign in without having to have another username and password. I thought this was such an important part of having a consistent user experience that we made this a core requirement for joining the marketplace. We could also do things like import and export contacts, access and update calendars and documents, Applications can also publish uh, content and gadgets to sites. Gadgets turn out to be pretty useful in other contexts. You can actually use gadgets in Gmail, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, they also can be used on a uh, calendar and in uh, the Gmail sidebar. And another one, which is often overlooked, but we've seen some pretty clever uses of, is Google Talk as an integration point. And we'll, we'll see some examples of that later on. Of course, this is just a quick, uh, quick example of the things that you can do. Throughout the talk, I'm going to go into some of these uh, integration points in more detail and show you how some apps in the marketplace are using these today to drive additional value for customers and for their business. For you as an application developer, the reason this is so important is simple. Integration gets you more customers. A few weeks ago, I wanted to see if there was a correlation between how well integrated an application was and how it performed in the marketplace. So I decided to take a look at the top 100 applications in the marketplace. And this is measured by their weekly installs for the previous week. What I found is that the top 10 applications in the marketplace, all 10 of these went well beyond the minimum requirements for joining the marketplace. That is, in addition to single sign-on, they all found ways to integrate Google Contacts, Calendar, Docs, and so on. When you look out to the next 50, 
the rate's still pretty good. It's about three out of the four apps, but we're starting to see some apps that are really just, you know, getting by with the bare minimum. And when you go out to the top 100, that rate drops down to 66%. Now, of course, there are of variables that go into how well an application performs. The pricing model, the category of the app, how well they do marketing and support, all of these are things that we would have to control for in order to find out there's really a strong correlation, or a strong causation even. I'm still really interested in getting to that, the heart of that question, but fortunately, other people have been looking at this question and they came to the very same conclusion. Sunir Shah is founder of one of the applications in the, uh, in the marketplace, FreshBooks, and FreshBooks spends a lot of time integrating their app with others, not just Google Apps, but a whole host of other web applications that their customers use. When he blogged, he summed it up pretty simple for why this is so important. People want end-to-end -end solutions, it translates to the bottom line, and the kicker, if a customer uses any of their integrations, they're three times more likely to become a paying customer. That's a huge difference in conversion rates. For those of you who went to Scott McMullen's earlier talk, you may have heard Cameron from GQ's echoing that and he's seeing phenomenal differences in conversion rates when people use their integrations with Google Apps. Why do they convert? Because customers love integrations. Not only do they want those end-to-end -end solutions, but it saves them time and it makes them passionate about the products. Jeff Harmons, a small business owner and entrepreneur, was profiled in a case study with Outright and Google Apps, and he summed it up. Right? This is icing on the cake. He can stay focused and move on to helping the next customer or spending time with my family. In other words, by saving time, making them more efficient, we're letting our customers focus on the things which are important to them. It's a little paradoxical, but this is exactly what we want. We want people spending less time in our applications and more time doing what's important. So when we talk about integrations, we don't want to just add features to our applications for any old reason. We don't want to add integrations just to say that we did them. Uh, so when you think about what you can do with your application, you really want to focus on those things which provide immediate value to your customers and save them time and save them effort. For today, I'm going to focus on three areas where I think integration can help us do that. The first is on the out-of-the-box experience. Right? How do we use integration and the data available to us to help make users, uh, uh, help them get up to speed more quickly on our application and become productive? The second is collaboration. How do we use the uh, integration points available and the data to help people connect to their coworkers and their customers and suppliers and work more effectively together? And the third is improving access to information, saving them time by making information available to them when they need it and where they need it. So let's start with the out-of-the-box experience. Something really important to note about the marketplace is that this is not a traditional enterprise sales channel. There are no salespeople, there's no sales engineers, consultants, or anything to help customers set up, configure, deploy, and train users. So it puts a burden on you as an application developer to make sure that your applications are designed for a self-service model. Things like uh, the configuration and deployment need to be very easy and streamlined. Training for users needs to be built into the application so people can get started with minimal effort. So when it comes to integration, there's one area where I think we, we actually can provide a lot of values to user, and that's in the user account provisioning process. And for those uh, who've been in the enterprise space, you know this is a this has been a pain point for a long time, and fortunately, over the past decade or so, we've actually seen a convergence on LDAP directories in the enterprise as a way to manage user accounts and authenticate users and ensure people have the right permissions. Unfortunately, when we all made the move to the cloud, a lot of those lessons have been lost. Uh, so today in the marketplace, what we're seeing for provisioning is really two models emerging. One is uh, what I would describe as an invite model, and this is where uh, an administrator has to explicitly create a, an account for their users before those users can log in and use the application. The second is an ad hoc model. And this is where accounts and organizations are just dynamically created and associated every time a new user logs in for the first time. In either case, remember that we're always authenticating the user with their Google account through our single sign-on mechanism, which is based on OpenID. But in addition to being a way to do single sign-on and authentication, OpenID is also an opportunity to streamline the setup process for users. We can do this by taking advantage of an extension called Attribute Exchange, which allows us to fetch profile information, such as the user's first name, their last name, 
and uh, language and email address. So let's actually take a look at this in, uh, in practice and how it can improve the apps. This is actually a screenshot from another app in the marketplace, Batchbook, a CRM application. And this is their sign-up form that users who come directly to their site would see when they sign up. It looks really much just, just like any other sign-up form on any other web application. The problem, though, is that the longer and more complicated these forms become, the more opportunity and the more reason there is for users to abandon your sign-up funnel. So it's really important that you make the sign-up process as streamlined as possible. When it came to integrating with the marketplace, they were able to take advantage of Attribute Exchange and OpenIE to simplify this greatly. The result is a form which is basically one field asking for their time zone. And if they really wanted to, they probably could have skipped this too by using geolocation data to figure out where the user is or using some JavaScript to test the browser's time zone. But you can see that by using the information they got when the user authenticated, they were able to eliminate the need to ask for their name and email. They were able to eliminate the need to ask for a password. And the whole process became much, much simpler for users. When you talk about the invite model, the savings can actually be even more dramatic. So in this case, we're looking at a screenshot from Expensify, which is an expense reporting application in the marketplace. This is a screen in the form that administrators would see when they need to uh, bring additional users into the application to get started. For a small company, if you have five people, this isn't really that big a deal. Right? You probably know everyone. You know their email addresses. You could probably set them up in you know, under a minute. But what happens when you get to 20 users, or 50, or 100, or 500? This process breaks down. When they joined the marketplace, they were able to simplify this by taking advantage of some information available to applications from our user feed. This basically gives you access to the list of users in the domain, including their name, email, and so on. The result for administrators is that now they just get a form with all of their users pre-populated. And to complete the work, they just simply need to say, who are the, what are the reporting relationships, and who has access to approved expense reports? Much simpler, much faster, and as the company sizes scale up, the savings become more and more dramatic. The user feed has another purpose, which is really, really useful for uh, speeding adoption of your application, which is helping administrators uh, improve the awareness of your application and provide them some training material. This is a screenshot. Uh, text might be a little bit hard to read, but it's uh, from another expense reporting app, Concur Breeze. And at the end of their deployment wizard, they present administrators the option of sending an email to all their users, or at least all the ones that they invited into using the application. And that email provides them with some quick instructions about how to actually get started with the application and begin ex submitting expense reports. Uh, you know, so for, you know, if, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the importance of, of building training into your application, uh, leveraging the user feed, leveraging the list of users, and proactively reaching out to them is a great way to, to provide some of that training material, and we'll go into some more of it later as well. Uh, of course, if you do, you, know, you do have access to this user feed information, you do have to be careful not to abuse it. Um, it's a lot of information. You have the email addresses for an entire company. Don't spam users. Don't abuse the information. Try to be a good net citizen. Give admins the ability to opt out. And likewise, if you start subscribing people, give them an opt out as well. Please you know, comply with all the spam regulations. So what we just saw are like, two different ways of, of basically getting the same information. You saw the user feed and open ID with attribute exchanges. And if you compare them side by side, you actually see you get pretty much the same information from both. Uh, you get email, first name, and last on both APIs. OpenID does give you the language, whereas the user feed gives you a little bit more detail about the user's role in the organization and their account status, whether it's enabled or disabled. The main difference is when this information is available and about which users. With OpenID, we're always getting information about the current user at the time that they log in. With the user feed, the application can get information about any or all users on the domain at the request of the application. One important note with OpenID is that the attribute information does require that you do additional verification if you want to use it for anything other than pre-filling in a registration form. Uh, you can do things like uh, verify that the OpenID request is from a trusted identity provider like Google, where you know that they do some verification of the information. Uh, you could also just do traditional verification techniques uh, 
such as sending somebody a, a verification email to make sure that they actually have access to the email address. So before we move on to collaboration, I just wanna quickly wrap up here. Remember that you do wanna streamline adoption as much as possible. The longer and more complicated you make your setup process, especially in a self-service model, the greater the chances customers are going to abandon that funnel uh, or delay or just never come back at all. The simpler you make it, the better and the higher your conversions will be. You can do this by taking advantage of existing data. We talked about two strategies for doing this. One is OpenID, the other is the user feed. And it's actually pretty common for applications to use a combination of both these APIs. One, to you know, pre-fetch pre the list of users in the domain, but still using OpenID and attribute to make sure that uh, they're actually authenticating the correct users. Uh, you can also use this information for training purposes and to increase awareness. Again, you do wanna make sure that you don't sacrifice security or become a bad net citizen. Verify your attributes when you're using OpenID. Don't abuse the email list, don't spam users. So I wanna talk next about collaboration. And when we talk about collaboration, there's two aspects that we like to talk about. One is collaboration among people. These are my customers, my coworkers, my suppliers, people that I need to connect to. And the other aspect is the actual data that we're collaborating on. So how do we use integration to make this more effective? We'll start with a really simple example in Google Apps, which is auto-completion of contacts. One of the things I love as a user of Google Apps is whether or not I'm sending an email inviting somebody to a meeting or sharing a document, I rarely have to remember somebody's email address. I simply type in the first few characters of somebody's name, and it's gonna display me a list of matching people, and I can quickly select. In fact, I rely on this so much, I, I actually don't remember all that many email addresses of people that I talk to on an almost daily basis. Uh, and it's one of these things where the time saving seems really small, but based on the frequency that we communicate with each other, it actually builds up to be very quickly. So as a user, I've come to expect this behavior in other applications. Now, it turns out the data is available for third-party applications like your own to actually do this. Here we see a screenshot from Mavenlink, a project management application that actually syncs with Google, Google Contacts in order to provide that same user experience of auto-completion to users in that application. It's actually really simple to do. Probably the most confusing part of it, though, is the fact that we have so many different APIs for accessing information about people. For starters, we do have the Contacts API, which gives you personal contacts for an individual user. But we also have some additional APIs, such as the Shared Contacts API, which is a global address list for a domain uh, of users who are external. There's a related API called the Profiles API, which is a global address list of internal users. And to make it even a little bit more complicated, there is the previously mentioned user feed, which gives you a subset of all this information for domain users. So the question is, like, which ones do you use if you want to get information about people that I collaborate with? Well, both of the shared context APAs are restricted to Google Apps for business and education customers. And so from a developer's per perspective, uh, you do need to be aware of that and you know, code defensively and make sure that you're not relying on those APIs being available. Uh, I encourage you to actually look at the context, both the context API and the user feed first. And the contacts are useful in cases when you want to get uh, usually external contacts that a person might know. And the user feed is a great way just to get a list of uh, somebody's coworkers or all the people in the domain as another source of information for auto-completion. Of course, you can still use these other APIs, and it's actually a great way to add additional value for those larger customers that are actually on Google Apps for Business. Um, and drive additional value for them. Another way that document-centric apps, at least, can add some basic collaboration features is by taking advantage of Google Docs as a storage mechanism. Here we actually see a screenshot from Ganter, which is another project management app that does Gantt charting, and they've seamlessly integrated Google Docs as a cloud file system. One of the things missing, though, from Ganter's implementation is the notion of who we're actually sharing with. So as a user, if I wanted to share this project plan with the team that I'm working on, I'd have to go back into Google Docs, find that document, and then set the, sh the sharing permission so that everyone has access. And that way, when they opened up Gantry, they would be able to see that document as well. 
So how do we make this better? How do we make this more seamless? Let's take a look at another example, another project management app called ManyMoon. And ManyMoon allows users to attach Google Docs to projects and tasks. And you can actually just search for a doc or create a new one. But they do something else which is pretty clever. They actually take a look at what the user's intent is when they do this. And they realized, when I attach a doc, I'm not sharing a link. That's not what I want to do. What I really want to do is share the content of the document itself. And since ManyMoon knows both the set of users who are working on that project and the set of documents that have been shared with the team, it can proactively manage the ACLs for the documents. And they do that by taking advantage of the ACL feed in the documents API. Anytime a user or a document is either added to or removed from a project, the ACLs are automatically updated. To understand how important this is and how much of a time saver it is, you have to realize what would happen if they didn't do this. If I were to share a document with the team and send it out for review, but I didn't set the permissions, anyone who came along would try to open up the document, they'd get an error, and they'd have to send off an email to me asking for me to approve access. If I happened to be an email at the time, that's not so bad. Right? It might take me a minute or two to, to see that email and make sure that they have the right permissions. But if I'm stuck in a meeting, or if I have to go out of the office for a day or two, those, that minute can stretch into a few hours or can stretch into a few days. So all that time, those users are blocked waiting for me to take action. So it's really great to see applications like ManyMoon, Mavenlink, Box.net, and a few others improve upon our sharing model to make collaboration really effortless. So we, before we move on to the next section, I just want to quickly wrap up again here. Remember, you can import the context in the user feeds to make sharing with people easier. This is something that Google Apps users have come to just rely on in Google Apps. They come to they'll come to rely on it in your applications as well. This is also great for apps that spread virally. Um, if you have an invite model where you uh, rely on people socializing your app for you, uh, kickstarting that process with their contacts is a great way to get additional customers in. Remember that sharing is not just linking. We really want to focus on the content that we're sharing and making sure that people have access to it. And of course, none of this is limited to contacts or documents. This all applies to you know, uh, any piece of data that you can have in your application. It may be you know, calendars and team projects. It could be your customer records and your CRM. Anything that people collaborate on, you want to find ways to make collaboration as simple as possible. So the th third area I want to focus on is improving access to information. So we've seen how we can you know, streamline the setup for our users. We can make it easier for them to connect to each other. But we still have some inefficiencies in how people work that we can make better. And let's start with an example of this. So suppose I'm a salesperson, and I get this email from a customer. And the customer wants to do a pilot. And potentially, it's going to be this you know, huge company-wide rollout that could be worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in business for us. So what do I do? Well, assuming that we actually have a, a CRM that we use to track these opportunities, let's say, in this case, uh, Solve360, Solve which is another application in the marketplace, I'd have to go and switch over to that application, look up that customer record, and search for the right entry, uh, then update it. I might have to switch back and forth between Gmail and the CRM in order to copy and paste some information back and forth to make sure the CRM is up to date. It works, but I'm losing time in doing that. So how do you make it better? Well, the answer is you bring the application into the mail itself. And so this is what Contextual Gadgets allows developers to do. It's actually embed their application in Gmail in the context where it's actually needed. And you can actually match on things like who sent the message, the subject, the content of the message itself, and use that to determine what your gadget shows or if it should show at all. So the advantage is now as a customer or as a user, I don't have to go and, and, and look at that customer record. It already knows who the customer is based on who sent the email. Now I can just open that up, update the opportunity, and do this without ever leaving the message and without ever leaving Gmail. Really, really powerful. Turns out to be one of the most popular features uh, the application the developers are using today, and rave, re rave reviews from users using these integrations. So a quick tutorial on how these work. They actually turn out to be really simple. 
uh, it is all based on open social, which is an open standard for embedding third, third party content into an application. If you could write HTML and JavaScript, you can write a gadget. It's basically what it is. It's just HTML and JavaScript and a small bit of XML to wrap it up. For gadgets, the way it works is you start with an email, the customer opens it up. In the background, what happens is we extract some information from that message and run it through a filter. And these rules for these, the fields that we extract and the patterns that we match are defined in the manifest for your application. If there's a match, we render the gadget. Again, that just is HTML and JavaScript, which then gets rendered into the email itself. It's a really simple process. It does take a little bit of work just to get started, but once you are, you're just using the same development tools that you use for writing your own web application. There are a couple catches with contextual gadgets. First is you have very, very limited real estate on the screen. You noticed in uh, the screenshot of the Solve360 gadget that their default view basically just showed two buttons. And they don't expand into the full view unless the user explicitly clicks and takes action. Part of the reason for this is, you know, one, it's, it's a very small area in Gmail underneath the message you ha have to do this. And the other thing is you ha some users may have multiple gadgets. And so if one of them is taking up a lot of screen real estate, other gadgets that the user might be interested in for that particular message could end up getting buried you know, beneath uh, the fold and, and they'd have to scroll down to get it. It's not a very good user experience. Uh, in addition to that, we encourage people to match very conservatively. Uh, for some gadgets, that's pretty easy to do. If you're uh, a gadget for approving an expense report or somebody's timesheet, it's pretty easy to recognize if it's an email from your application that you want to embed uh, a gadget for. For CRM apps, project management, it might be a little harder to come up with a set of very narrow rules, and so you're probably going to trigger on just about every message that a user receives. And that's where it becomes even more important to make sure that your UI is kept small until the user wants to actually engage with your gadget. Another limitation that you do need to be aware of is gadget cons gadgets only have access to about 1K worth of data in the email itself. Uh, this is just a technical limitation in how it's built. Uh, there are some workarounds, though. So one way to do this is to use uh, some extensions that we have in IMAP uh, so that you can fetch the content of the email and the attachments in the background. Uh, to make this easier, we do have OAuth authentication for uh, IMAP clients, so you don't need to ask for the user's username and password in order to access their email. They can just delegate this in a secure way to your application. And there are also some protocol extensions to make it easy to access emails based on uh, the Gmail message and thread IDs, as well as manipulate labels. So the same open social technology actually has uses in other contexts. Uh, within Gmail itself, you can actually use gadgets in the sidebar. Here we actually see a screenshot from uh, Lassian's Jira Studio. It's a hosted development environment that includes uh, bug tracking, uh, issue tracking, continuous build server, and so on. So for a developer, instead of having to go and switch over to, to Jira to go and check to see what my open issues are, it's really nice to have that list of all my hot issues and my top priorities in my Gmail sidebar, always, so it's always available at a quick, uh, quick glance. So using open social and open social gadgets, they actually provide a Gmail gadget that you can, you can embed and keep that list readily available. You can do the same thing in Calendar. Here we see a gadget from TripIt, which is an expense, uh, or rather a trip uh, planning tool. And here I can see in my calendar sidebar my upcoming trips, as well as the trips of people that I'm connected to inside TripIt. Talk is another really useful integration point. Uh, again, going back to Atlassian, they, uh, they've integrated Talk into their build servers, the continuous build servers, as a lightweight mechanism to push out build status. So I'm a developer, it's the end of the day, I've just checked in a change and I'm waiting for the next build to, to go green so that I can go home and know that I didn't you know, break the build and cause a whole bunch of developers a bunch of heartache. So rather than sending me an email, which is you know, pretty heavyweight, um, and clutters up my inbox, I can just open up a chat window with the build server and get those status updates pushed to me in near real time in a really lightweight way. Beyond pushing information, though, you can actually use talk as an input mechanism. What you see here is actually uh, an application for, uh, this is GQs, which is a, a to-do list uh, project planning tool. And they allow people to enter in items into the to-do to list by basically just chatting with the application. And they just use a little bit of language processing 
to convert that text into an item that would appear on your to-do list, in your calendar, and on your phone and elsewhere. Uh, really great way, um, you know, even if you don't have a mobile application, pretty much everyone can do SMS or IM on their phone. Really nice, lightweight way to do uh, data, data input for some apps. For talk, just remember, talk is just XMPP. This is an open protocol. It's widely used. Lots of libraries out there to make it easy. And if you are interested in using talk as an integration point, really encourage you to take a look at App Engine. App Engine has both built-in client libraries in, for both Python and Java, and of course now today Go, uh, but it also has some built-in classes to make writing chatbots really easy. And even if you don't use App Engine yourself for hosting your main application, it actually turns out to be really useful as a bridge. You can actually just use it as a chat front end and forward all those calls to your application using your own APIs. Um, but a great way that you can get started with Talk without really investing a lot into infrastructure or tools. And uh, I think uh, Cameron mentioned that his, his Talk integration is something he, uh, he did on App Engine in about two days worth of work. So pretty easy to get started. Turns out to be pretty useful for a lot of apps. In a lot of these use cases, we've really been talking about consuming information from Google Apps. In addition to consuming, if you publish information and make it available, lots of really good things can happen. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose I'm starting up a new marketing campaign. Right? I'm going to go into my project management tool, and I'm going to create a new project to say, let's work on our new marketing text for our email marketing campaign. I've got to create some deadlines around that project. I've got to create a document that we can use to draft up the text. Well, if we publish that into Google Docs, and we use Docs for storage, and we update our calendars, that information is now available in a whole bunch of different places. It right? shows up on my desktop or my laptop through my calendar and my Docs and my Gmail. And it also shows up on my phone. In fact, I probably use my mobile phone for reading my calendar and my email more than I use my desktop. That information, though, can then be consumed by other applications that also integrate with Google Apps. So in this case, our email marketing tool can then import that document that we've drafted up in our project and then use that to send out our marketing campaign. Our marketing campaign goes really well. We get some customers. Now I add somebody to my CRM. Right? Well, if that customer re record is then published back into Google, Google Contacts, again, it's now available you know, on my desktop, in, in my Gmail, in my Contacts, in Google Docs, in Google Calendar, everywhere that Google Apps uses contacts. It's also available on my phone. And it could also show up in our support system so that when we have a ticket with that customer, we can trace that back to our CRM. It could show up in our customer, in a, a list of customers for our next marketing campaign that we send out in our marketing tool. So by publishing information and sharing it, you can actually use Google Apps as a hub to get additional integrations with other applications. Really, really powerful, and we're starting to see this happen uh, in the marketplace as users uh, start to use more and more applications together. Now, of course, there are cases where it doesn't make sense to use Google Apps as a hub. And I actually encourage you to go out and do some integrations directly. Earlier, I mentioned FreshBooks and how they invest a lot in integrating with other applications. Well, I took a look at their list of integrations and those apps in the marketplace, and just the intersection of those two lists Actually, it looks like that. So these are all the apps in the marketplace that FreshBooks already works with directly. There's actually a whole list of other apps that aren't yet in the marketplace that it could have added to this list. If you go out the next level and you find out who they integrate with, you get more. And these aren't just one-way integrations. They actually all integrate with each other. So you actually get this nice network of applications that integrate not just with Google Apps, but with each other as well. Everything I said here about integration holds true whether or not you're integrating with Google Apps or any other web application out there. And I sincerely encourage you to go out, talk to your customers, find out what they're using, and if there's a way that your application and those applications they use today can work better together through some sort of integration, go ahead and do it. Your customers will love it. Beyond just helping your customers and giving them more value, it opens up some additional value to you as your business because it gives you co-marketing opportunities, it gives you referral traffic. Basically, it's, just, it's a way that applications can help each other grow and thrive. So wrapping up the, uh, the access area, 
keep in mind that, you know, this context switching that we talked about at the beginning is a big productivity killer. You want to find ways to do that. A couple different strategies. One is to bring applications to the users where they need it. Contextual gadgets for Gmail or any of the gadgets, whether they're sidebar, in Gmail, calendar, sites, wherever. Just a great way to bring functionality to users where they need it. The other way is to publish data. Make it available so that people in, in other Google apps or other third-party apps that integrate can also access that data in a simple way. And again, remember, this is not just for Google apps. Really, I, I want to reinforce this again. Find out what your customers use. Integrate. I don't care if it's Google apps or not. They will appreciate it. You will find a return on that investment. So there are a few more things that I want to talk about. Um, so I mentioned earlier how the marketplace is you know, not a traditional enterprise sales channel. You really have to focus on ease of use and deployment and really make sure that you have a nice, clean, intuitive UI. This is uh, one of my favorite apps, Mavenlink. Uh, we actually just named them uh, yesterday as our first uh, staff pick in the marketplace. Uh, and I think they do a great job at making it really easy for users to get started. Not only is the interface itself clearly, you know, clearly labeled and intuitive, but they have this nice built-in tutorial so that when users jump into the app, they actually are trained how to use the app using the application itself. Really easy for users to get started. Um, they get you know, tons of great reviews because they focus so much on making sure that their app is designed for self-service and for small companies to get started quickly. Even if you look at their help system, their help system is just a layer on top of the UI itself. So you know, there, there's no switching back and forth, reading long documents on how to use it. They can just say, hey, what's this? Click on a link, click on a video to learn how to use it. Great app, really good uh, one to study in terms of um, how to build something that users can get up to speed with very, very quickly. Of course, you know, with all this, if you, can, you can build all the integrations in the world. You can add all sorts of cool features. But if customers don't understand them, if they don't know that they exist, it's not going to do much for your application. So don't forget marketing. You do want to make sure that you have a very high quality listing page that clearly expa explains both the value of your application plus the value of the integrations themselves. Uh, you can also do this on your site itself by having a very high quality landing page that can go into more detail. Blogging, tweeting, PR outreach, all of these are important to make sure that you have a really successful launch on the marketplace. Uh, another resource that we uh, sometimes talk about is uh, leveraging your existing customers. And they turn out to be a great way to, to really bootstrap your growth on the marketplace. Um, so if you, do, if you are joining the marketplace and you happen to have a, a set of customers who are already on Google Apps, I encourage you to go out to them, encourage them to try your application from the marketplace. And if they like it, if they like the integrations, go out and provide ratings and reviews in the marketplace. This will help your application move up in the search results, get higher placement, and additional customers will follow it. Uh, also, if, uh, you know, if we start to see some uh, growth in your traffic, it's more likely that it will appear on our radar so that we can get you into a featured or a notable section. Or you know, if you build something really, really cool and amazing, you know, we'll get you into, like, maybe we'll pick you as the next staff pick. Um, so that's really the challenge for you guys as developers, just to go out there and just build something that's really amazing, that really saves customers time and effort, um, and takes advantage of the various integration points in that process. Of course, this is you know, just a small, small sampling of the things that are possible. Uh, I did mention earlier that we just started our staff pick program yesterday. Um, we will be naming apps probably two to three times a month. Um, so we are you know, looking for really the best, you know, the, not only the best integrated, but the easiest to use and the most value that you can provide to customers. Again, impress us. That's the challenge that we're putting out there. And we will try to help you get more customers uh, if, you, if you build it, the, those really great quality apps. Um, of course, while the focus of today was integration, it's not the only factor. Uh, don't forget your uh, price, you know, marketing. Pricing is important. Marketing is important. There was actually a really great talk last year at I.O. from Don Dodge. She did a panel on um, freemium pricing models. And so for those of you that have a freemium model or, or are thinking about it, uh, I encourage you to go back uh, to last year's I.O. site, look for this session. It was uh, really, really interesting. Lots of great advice in there for um, how different businesses should structure their pricing in today's business world. 
And again, for the third time, this is not just for Google Apps. Anything you learn today, you can apply it to any app that your customers use. And you know, again, go out, find it, build those integrations. Your customers will appreciate it. There are a few resources uh, that I want to share, which is one is the marketplace uh, itself, which is google.com slash enterprise slash marketplace. Uh, documents and forums for uh, developing these integrations are at code.google.com slash Google Apps. Our blog, googleappsdeveloper.blogspot.com. Uh, there's a few Twitter handles that you might want to follow. There's the official Google Apps developer uh, handle at Google Apps Dev. There's also a few more handles of some members of the team that we do post frequently, uh, Don Dodge, Ryan Boyd, Scott McMullen, and myself. Um, certainly encourage you to follow. Uh, we're always looking for interesting people to follow as well. Uh, so if you have one, you follow us. If uh, you know, probably follow you back as well. And uh, certainly session feedback is appreciated. Then there's the short link for those who are interested in providing it. Um, so that's all I have for today. I do want to turn it over for questions. If you do have a question, please use the microphones. Uh, this session is being recorded, and it will just help to make sure that everyone can hear the question. Uh, and other than that, um, happy to talk to, to anyone after the presentation as well. So thanks. Any, uh, any questions? or? Or not. All right. Well, thanks.